so what we're going to do now is going to work on the bulge so it only affects the object when it's moving, when it's actually hitting the ground. Because right now it's affecting before it hits the ground. It's just not right. It's like it's reaching down or melting. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to actually look at the object's lowest position and look at the grid's lowest position and find the distance between those. And as long as that distance is means it's hitting the ground, it's less than zero, then we're going to say, OK, let's go ahead and bulge. If not, don't bulge. So we're going to use a bounding box. That's one of the um, default compounds that comes with XSI. And we're going to hook this into a new custom property. So we're going to do a set data. And we'll just hook in the min y into the value and hook this one into the execute. And we're going to put in a new node here. Insert port before. We want this to be the first port because we want it to be before anything. That didn't go in there. That was it after. I just hooked this into two and this one into one. Great. We're going to give this a name. And if I go to the type self right now and hit explore, we can see there's different ones, but we want to make a new custom one. We're going to call it um, deform dist. So just type deform dist. So everything's red right now because that doesn't exist, but the minute I hit enter, that new custom property exists, and we can see it right now when we look in here, we can actually see deform dist. So we have a new custom property. And we're going to use that later on. We're going to visualize this number here to see what's going on. Show values. And when we show it, you'll see minus 2. And if we move the object up and down, it always says minus 2. The reason it's saying that is the bounding box compound that comes with XSI doesn't take into account transformations. So we need to make it do that. So we're going to go into compound by clicking little e to edit the compound. And we're going to go and get its kinematic position or transformation. So we'll do another get data. And what we'll do is we're going to get, we'll explore it. It'd be the sphere kinematic global transformation. And then we need to use this global transformation and link it in so it takes the particle position gives it the global particle position, not the local. So we're going to do a multiply by vector. And we can actually see this multiply vector by matrix. And this is called a matrix. And here's our vector. We're just going to rearrange some stuff around here so it's cleaner. And then we're bringing the output from here, the result, into the vector. And you'll see instantly that number changes. That's why visualization is so important to see what's going on inside your ice trees. And now we know, OK, that number is going down. As we move it down lower, it eventually gets to zero when it's hitting the ground. And if we actually took the deformation off for a second, we'd actually see that happen. If I unhook this ice tree here, by dragging on here, and you can see when it hits the ground, then it goes to zero. And when it goes below ground, it's actually increasing the number, even though it's been deformed, because we're actually evaluating this number first of all. But that's not everything we need. We need to know, has it hit this object? Now, this object's at zero, so that would be very simple. But say the object's not at zero, how do we know that? Well, we need to go in and do another bounding box. But this time we need a bounding box, not looking at let's frame that, not looking at the actual sphere, we need to look at the grid. So again, there's no inputs here. So again, we're going to change the bounding box to actually support inputs. So there's an in name here, and it says sphere, so we're going to change this in a second. But we're going to expose input into the in name. Now this is particle position. I'm going to change this to point position. Same thing, really. If you look inside this, it's just 
a point position inside of there. So it's just very simple compound. Delete that particle position. And you can see the in name. I'm just going to hook this in name in. There we go. And we'll hook this one in there. And actually, I'm going to not even use this one here. I'm just going to do a, a basic get data because it still has a compound. So just a get data. The get data has the in name already for you. And we're just going to explore and get the grid polygon point position. And we're going to change this to grid. But here's a problem. I actually don't want the grid to be referenced to inside these nodes. So I'm actually going to remove any reference to the grid from both of these. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm using an in name. And you see the in name here, I hook it to the other one. And it creates a pass through node, it's just a simple node that allows everything to be plugged in together. It's almost like a power strip, it just has one input and multiple outputs. Everything's red right now because it's not working, because we're not looking at the grid. We have our grid here and we have an out name. We just bring the out name into the in name and then everything turns blue. Now it's looking at the grid. And if we actually hook this one in here, we'll actually see, let me just do the, the max Y into the deformed disk and visualize that, show values. We see now a zero. If we were to move this up and down, we can see that number increasing, decreasing. So now we have these two values. We have our distance of the grid and we have our distance of the sphere. We're going to also edit this one, make sure anything's like here itself. But again, we can just very quickly duplicate our new one that has the in name. And then we can just go in and either edit inside or change that to self. So we could actually do another input, but just going to go here and change these to self. Self dot, and then it will still work. And the other thing is, we instead of doing self inside here, you could have done self outside. So you can actually do a get data. It's kind of funny, but you can just type in here self. And then you can use the out name into that in name here, and then you don't have to change anything inside the compound. Just a very simple way of connecting these up. And it means we're using the same compound twice. We should rename this compound so we know it's a new one. It has a star and it means it's been changed. But you can rename it just by going to your compound properties. And I'm just going to change this to global bounding box. And we'll do it the same for this one as well. Or we could just copy it because they now will work the same way. We can just take that one, control C, control V, delete this one and then rehook everything up. There we go. So we have two global bounding boxes now. We can export this out later on. So we can use this as a default compound. Actually I made one earlier, but I'm just going to export this out anyway. Export compounds. And we have one already in here, but that's fine. It's called Global Bounding Box. And it's been saved out. Okay. So we have that saved. We could have gone on properties to tell it where to go as well. If you look at this, if we go to Compound Properties, it still has the particle getters deformation, so it knows what it was because we had an original compound and since we gave it a new name we can actually find that global bounding box there we are so we're happy with this let's go ahead and now make sure we can find some get some more information here so we need to know the distance between those two objects 
So I'm typing distance in, and you can see there's a get distance between. We're going to take this first and second. We may have to change this in a little bit. So the max y, the min y. Again, just going to visualize some of these, hook it in. It has to be hooked into the graph to actually visualize anything, so show values. We can now see it's 0.7. We just pick the object itself. As I move it up, the number increases. As I move it down, the number decreases. I can invert a number if I want, or I can just swap these values around here. I'm just going to swap the values around here because it would be quicker than inverting. There we go. So now it's when it goes below, it goes positive. When it's above, it's negative. A couple more nodes to add to this to make it more useful. We want to make sure the number between 0 and 1, just because we're using this as a kind of turn off, turn on blend. So we'll just bring the result into a clamp node and clamp it between 0 and 1. And I could have just dragged that clamp node in between here. So we could have just taken the clamp node again and dragged it onto this line and just hooked it in. Again, we can visualize this once more. Show values. I wish that stayed on, but it doesn't. So it's zero. And it's going to stay zero because the clamp is currently set to zero to zero. So we're set with zero to one. And we can see as we move it down, as long as it's below the ground, it's, it's above zero. And that's really useful for our test. So almost done. One couple more things to hook in to make sure this is going to work is we need to go in and it's going to increase slowly. So it's actually going to multiply this number by our bulge. And I may want that number to increase faster than here. It's only 0.3. And especially if the object's larger or smaller, I may not get the results I want. So this is making it more. So that's why I'm just going to multiply by scalar. And just in between here, between the clamp and the get between. And you can see it hooked all that in. Going to spread stuff out again so, so we can see what's going on in our graph. And then we have a little multiplier here we can increase. So it's going to increase faster. And you can see now that number by 2 is going to go up to 1 much quicker than it was before. And you'll probably use the object size or just increase it based on smaller objects. Of course, we'll have a higher multiply value than large objects. Okay. So this is all good. Now how do we use it? Well, if we hook our bulge back in, nothing's changed yet. So the final step is going to be to take our bulge and multiply it by this new deformed distance. So we just one more multiply. We've got plenty of multiplies in here, so we'll just make another one. We can control C, control V. And we'll just put it in here before the add. Okay, so that's another multiplier there. And then we need to do a get data. Because we've been setting this deform distance, and now we need to get that deform distance and hit, feed it into this factor here. So we'll just get that. And we can see if we search for it here, we could type in deformed distance. Here, connect it into factor here. And if all goes well, we just saw a change, but now it's not deforming until it hits the ground. And if we say, oh, well, it's not deforming enough, that's what the multiplier here is for. And we can adjust this multiply to have it deform quicker or less on hit. So you can see. Let me just move this up a bit. As we increase this number here, it will take a bit of time to update. But you can see there the change. That's this case. If I decrease it down, have much lower value, it's going to form less and slower until it gets further down. So we really want this number to be left at ideally at 1.
or higher. And it's the quicker it deforms. But never snaps in, it's always that kind of linear blend into the deform that I like and the effects I was looking at creating. So this is almost it. A couple more things we need to do. There's definitely need to clean this up a bit. But we're going to stop here and we'll move with the next video and make a few more changes.